you know, the pill kills. And I'm going to tell you during this talk how that happens. But I'm going to start with, if the pill does kill, why do teenagers love it so much? Well, it gives them bigger breasts. They have lighter periods, predictable periods, painless periods. It gives them nice skin. And then they think they don't have to worry about pregnancy if they happen to slip up. If the pill is so bad, why do their parents love it? Well, they know that they're, it'll keep their kids from getting pregnant. They don't know about the failure rate so much. So they worry less. Sometimes they just have a great denial mechanism going on where they say, well, she's on it for acne or she's on it because she has very heavy, painful periods. And they think it'll make their kids responsible if they do choose to have sex. And more importantly, they don't really understand the medical risks. So there are four major mechanisms how the pill can kill. They cause your blood to clot. They cause cancer. They make it easier to get potentially lethal infections. And they make it more likely you'll die a violent death. So what about this blood clotting? Well, if the blood clots in an artery of your heart, it's a heart attack or an MI, a myocardial infarction. If it clots in your brain, that's called a stroke or a CVA, a cerebral vascular accident. If it causes clots in the veins in your legs, that's called a DVT or deep venous thrombosis. And if those clots in your legs break off and go to your lung, that's called a pulmonary embolism or a venous, venous thromboembolism, a VTE. So if you have a small clot going to your lung, maybe you don't even know it happened. But a big clot can kill you very quickly. Women who take the pill have twice the risk of having a myocardial infarction. But then, if you add and if that woman has any other risk factors other than the pill, the risk goes even higher. So, if a woman has hypertension, it increases her risk five times. And sometimes the pill alone, in and of itself, will induce hypertension. If she smokes, she has 12 times the risk of getting a heart attack. If she has diabetes, it's 16 times the risk. And if she has an elevated cholesterol, it's 23 times the risk. What about stroke? A meta-analysis is when you look at all the studies done on a particular subject in aggregate. So I'm showing you a study, a meta-analysis, that looked at 16 different studies looking at whether the pill causes stroke. And what they found was you have nearly three times the risk of having a stroke if you're on the pill. Now that's compounded if you have migraines because migraine headaches involve a blood vessel constricting in your head that slows the blood flow and makes it even more easier to clot. And that was actually one of my first patients when I got out of medical school and I was an intern. She was 26 years old. She had two children. She was hemiplegic. She had been on the pill and had migraines, and her husband left her. What about this uh, venous thromboembolism? If you're on the pill, you have a much, much higher risk of getting not only clots in your legs, but clots that break off and go to your lungs. This is from a study that was done uh, and published in the British Medical Journal in 2001. But there are pills that are even more likely to give you a pulmonary embolism. And actually, those are the ones that you're hearing about on TV now, 
when lawyers advertise for clients who suffered heart attacks, strokes, pulmonary emboli, or death from the pill. And those two names are Yaz, Yasmin, and Osella. And they contain third generation progestins. So the pill is a combination, most birth control pills are combination estrogen progestin drugs. Most of the time the progestin is levonorgestrel. However, in these pills, there's desogestrel, gestodine, and other pills that have more androgenic effect and that gives you 60 to 80 percent even higher risk than the second generation pills that most women take now. And when I say most women, I mean most women. There are 16 million women in this country of reproductive age between 15 and 45. 82 percent of them are taking the pill now or have taken them. So it's a significant uh, risk to our population. Now this is uh, something that most people don't know about. In 2000, the National Toxicology Advisory Program put estrogen on its list of carcinogens along with creosote and wood dust that year. And when the Associated Press interviewed one of the um, people on that, uh, on that uh, panel, they said, why'd you put estrogen? And she said, well, women aren't being told of the risks. And there is a metabolite of your normal estrogen, estradiol, that is a direct carcinogen in terms of causing genetic damage. It's called 4-hydroxycatecholestrogen quinone. And it actually pulls the rungs of the ladders, the purine bases out of the DNA chains. So it's actually a direct carcinogen. In 2002, if you were looking at the 6 o'clock news, you would have heard about the Women's Health Initiative study. And it was a great revelation to women that hormone replacement therapy increased the risk of breast cancer. And at that point in time, there were 30 million women on the hormone replacement therapy. 15 million women, or half of them, got off that year just because they heard about that increased risk. And as a result, by 2007, the incidence of breast cancer in women over 50 of estrogen receptor positive tumors went down 11%. Now, if you're postmenopausal, your ovaries aren't working. So you only need a little bit of that estrogen and progesterone to get an effect. But if you're premenopausal and you want to uh, suppress ovulation, you need much, much higher doses of those drugs. Those are the same drugs in birth control pills. So all this premenopausal breast cancer that we're seeing now, some of it is attributable to the pill. In 2005, the International Agency on Research of Cancer, which is part of the World Health Organization, a UN body, put out monograph 91 that stated estrogen progestin combination drugs in hormone replacement therapy and birth control pills were group one carcinogens the highest classifications, they're certain, are group one carcinogens for breast, cervical, and liver cancer. And yet that didn't make it on the six o'clock news. Now, they did show that there were lower rates of ovarian and uterine cancer because the fewer times you ovulate, the lower your risk of ovarian cancer. And it lowered your uterine cancer rate because estrogen and progestin uh, differentiate the uterine lining. 
However, if you took 100 women in this country with cancer, three of them have ovarian cancer, six have uterine cancer, and 36 have breast cancer. So it's not actually a trade-off. And you'll often hear that as a, a reason, well, you know, you're going to get cancer one way or the other, and well, this reduces and kind of is a wash. No, it's not. It's not a wash. And since when is it ever licit or a good idea to give a group one carcinogen to a child, a teenager, when they have no disease, that they're in good health, and a sign of good health is that you're fertile. So this is just some other studies since then. If you want a, a copy of that monograph, it's over 400 pages long. You can go to the, just do a Google search for IARC monograph 91, and you can download it in a PDF file. 2006, Chris Callenborn published a meta-analysis on the pill in the Mayo Clinic uh, Proceedings Journal. In 2009, Dahl, uh, and other authors put out this paper that showed that you had a 320% increased risk of triple negative breast cancer. Triple negative breast cancer is the hardest breast cancer to treat because it's not sensitive to hormonal treatment, it's not sensitive to that monoclonal antibody drug Herceptin, and there are a lot of deaths from it in premenopausal women, especially. So if you took the pill 18 and under, and that's very common. I have patients that come in, they're 22, and they've already been on the pill for 10 years because they got put on it when they were 12 and they had painful periods. So since 1975, by the governmental SEER data that you can also look up on the web, the incidence of in situ breast cancers, non-invasive breast cancers, has gone up 400% in premenopausal women. So when you ask the American Cancer Society, why are we seeing all these premenopausal women with breast cancer? You know, it's happening to younger and younger women. They will tell you, oh no, it just seems that way because women are more forthcoming now. They'll talk about it and they didn't talk about it before. Because they're using invasive cancers as the number that hasn't really changed much. So I ask you, and we've never gotten a good answer for this. Why is breast cancer the only cancer that the National Cancer Institute reports separately for invasive and non-invasive cancers? Why is it that they report bladder cancer as one number, invasive and non-invasive? Why is it that they report cervical cancer as one number, in situ and invasive. But something happened in 2003 that they had to separate it. So you also increase the risk of cervical cancer and you also increase the risk of liver cancer. So how are you more likely to develop a lethal infection? If you're on the pill, you're twice as likely to pick up an HIV infection and twice as likely to pass that virus on to your partner. You're also increasing the risk of getting HPV, human papilloma virus that causes cervical cancer. And now I'm going to talk about your increased risk of violent death. What's the leading cause of death in pregnant women? Because we, we know that some people want to tell you that it's um, safer to have an abortion than it is to have a full-term pregnancy. Well, it's homicide. 
So as early as 1980, it was noted that women who were on the pill had a substantial risk of death from accidents or violence. And then recently, in 2010, there was a large study that came out of England, or the UK, on the death rates of women on the pill versus off the pill. In general, they said you had a lower risk of dying, except for women having a violent death. And the risk of a violent death was higher in women who were on the pill. So that was unexplained until we have Craig Roberts writing into the British Journal on, on the internet and there are letters to the editor and he says, you know, I did, I did research in the late 70s about why that would be. And we found that there was a much higher risk of violent death on the pill. And it, this is why. Women who are on the pill tend to choose a partner that's most similar to them in major histocompatibility genes. Those are the genes that you look at when you want to do transplants, if somebody's a good match or not. And if you pick a partner like that that's very similar to you in those genes, you're more likely to be less sexually responsive, you're more likely to refuse sex, and you're more likely to have what's known as extra pair bondings in sociologic terms. But in other words, it's less sex, bad sex, and cheating. So one could see where that would lead to some violence in the relationship. They also will have problems conceiving children and have less healthy children. So it's very common to have women have injuries. There's a paper here from a Journal of Trauma showing that women the most common cause of non-fatal injury among women and accounting for a third of it is intimate partner violence. So in, in closing I would say that the pill is also an abortifacient. Remember one of the joys of the pill was that it gave you a lighter period and that's because the lining of the uterus doesn't fully thicken. So it's very thin, and that prevents implantation of the blastocyst. There are also biochemical changes that occur that also prevent the blastocyst from implanting even if the lining was thick enough. So that's why the problem is huge. It's, there's a lot of women on the pill, so you more likely to clot, more likely to get cancer, more likely to get infections, and more likely to die a violent death. Thank you.